right, we can go ahead and get started. So I wanted to start off. I'm Dr. Michelle Berkowitz. I'm the lead for the Neurodevelopment Intervention Science, IPC, and we're proud to be hosting for this grand rounds focused on early intensive interventions to promote school readiness and preschool children with externalizing behavior problems. Our presenter for today is Dr. Katie Hart, who was one of our Mailman Center psychology interns. And so I had the pleasure to get to supervise Kat within this role. And she is an associate professor of psychology and licensed psychologist at Florida National University and the Center for Children and Families. Her research is broadly focused on development, evaluation, and dissemination of early interventions to promote school readiness across home, school, and community settings for young children who present with external and behavior disorders or at risk for these conditions and related early learning problems. She is the director of the Reading Explorers Program and recently, recently recognized as a national pace setter from the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and the co-director of the summer treatment program for pre-kindergartners and early intervention program for young children with ADHD and related disorders. So Dr. Hart has her PhD and MA in clinical psychology from the University of Buffalo SUNY and a bachelor's in child development and cognitive studies from Vanderbilt University. And as mentioned earlier, you know, one of our proud graduates from our psychology internship program. So I'll now turn it over to her. Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be back at Mailman. I wish that it wasn't virtual. It's wonderful. I'm looking in the Zoom room. It's nice to see your faces and to come back. I hope folks have been staying as well as possible and safe during these challenging times. I really and truly valued my training at Mailman. It was one of my favorite training years. And I now tell all of my graduate students that they should do a practicum over at Mailman or they should consider Mailman as their internship home because it really did catapult a lot of where I am today. And I am just so grateful. And I'm excited to talk to you all about some work that started more than 10 years ago as part of my dissertation work at the University of Buffalo, but which interestingly all took place here in Miami when our center, the Center for Children and Families, moved to FIU in 2010. And I was part of that initial group of folks that came down to FIU. And we've now expanded this program that I'll talk to you about today in a number of ways, but it's really at the heart of the research that we do in my lab now at FIU. So, and before we get started in, I just wanna mention if anyone is needing for closed captioning, that feature is available and you can turn that on at the bottom of your screen in. And it's right under the live transcripts that are now available, but it has to be set by each individual user if needed. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, so today I, we're going to talk, uh, though I'm probably preaching to the choir because, you know, this is definitely where early intervention is happening across the board at Millman Center, but you know, the importance of promoting school readiness in young children with externalizing behavior problems. I'll talk about what we know about evidence-based early intervention approaches for these children, but I'm going to talk and spend most of my time really focusing on a program that we've been developing over the last 10 years that addresses a number of gaps that it currently exist in early intervention programming, particularly for young children with ADHD, and addressing this major developmental milestone, which is the transition to kindergarten and how we can really ensure that our kids are set up for success as they enter those early school years. So I have to thank Dr. Brosco um, because when I was an intern doing a rotation on the IDES team, we were having a meeting one day in his office to talk about a really complex case that we were evaluating and I remember looking over at his wall of accolades and seeing his kindergarten diploma. And I thought to myself, I need to do the exact same thing um, as I now have. This is my framed diploma that is in my real office, not my virtual office that I'm in today. 
Um, because the transition to kindergarten really sets the tone for lifelong learning. And I think that that was something that was really underscored in, in the training that I received at Mailman, but I think is also something that we all know as uh, folks who support early, er, early childhood and early intervention. Um, and this transition to kindergarten is, is, like I said, a major developmental milestone. And, but it's much different than it was when I was in kindergarten or when most of us were in kindergarten. And some people have now called kindergarten the new first grade. And, you know, it begs the question is how do we get kids ready? We know we just can't start when kindergarten, when those doors open on the first day. What does it really mean to be ready for school? And how do we get children, particularly those who are most vulnerable and those with neurodevelopmental disabilities, and again, of specific interest to me, young children with ADHD and other externalizing behavior problems, um, ready for those first days of school. So to help get us focused on the, what school readiness is, I want you to, I want us to think a little bit about what really encompasses school readiness. And if you think about the metaphorical backpack that a child, I mean, uh, literally and figuratively, that a child has to bring on the first day of kindergarten, at the child level, it historically we focused on literacy and numeracy and early academic skills, but now we know it's so much more than that. And that children also have to have a host of behavioral, social, emotional stuff self-regulation and adaptive skills to really be successful in the kindergarten environment. But it's not only the backpack that they bring to school, but the broader context, it's so much more. Um, so it's not only what they have in their backpack, but how, what their parents have in their backpacks and what they're bringing with them and how they can support their young child in this transition to kindergarten, how the what family supports that the child might have or that the parents have, um, the culture of the family, the school, school environment, access to school, access to early childhood or high quality early childhood education, and obviously a number of policy factors and related then to access. And that this shifts over time as well when kids transition to kindergarten. So there is a whole community and culture of early childhood education, but there's also a different community and culture of kindergarten. And it can be really challenging for families to navigate this transition. There's a lot going on, a lot of new requirements behaviorally where you're going from a much more child-led, uh, child, -led, uh, child led curriculum in early childhood to a much more teacher driven uh, and teacher directed curriculum in elementary school. And so, you know, there's a lot going on for all young children in this developmental time frame. And now if you throw on externalizing behavior problems, the picture becomes even a little bit more challenging. So what do I mean by externalizing behavior problems? I know many of you are familiar with these, um, but things like inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, defiance and aggression, and they are the most commonly referred problems among preschool children, both in school settings and in clinic settings. And we have a significant number of children um, coming to clinical attention for disorders like ADHD and ODD in the preschool years. Um, what that's basically, you know, when we look at the prevalence rates, that's basically one child in every early childhood classroom. And there's, it, it really indicates that, um, you know, we need to have a workforce of early childhood educators who also understand these challenges. Because when we look at some data that has come out of Walter Gilliam's um, shop, at Yale that we have higher national expulsion rates for children in pre-K programs at three times higher than those of K to 12 children. So there's a lot of a lot of kids, <laughs> unfortunately, who are getting kicked out of school at that early childhood level. And if you think about how then we're setting them up for success later on, you know, this is really, this is certainly, this makes it even more challenging. 
And again, I think I'm preaching to the choir on this, but without intervention, if we don't start early, you know, this just becomes worse over time with later problem behaviors in elementary school, academic deficits and underachievement, school failure, poor social emotional skills, and later on, increased risk for um, levels of higher levels of substance use and comorbid mental health concerns, which then would require even more expensive and costly intervention. So I think there's also a cost benefit of, uh, of working early to help address the needs of these children. So what do we do? My slide is not advancing. Give me a second. There we go. Okay. So what many of you, I, as I'm scrolling, I'm seeing a number of my previous supervisors and folks who I've worked with and, uh, and folks who probably are very familiar with the pyramid model. Um, so as pre-K programs have expanded nationally for young children, we're now seeing more children coming to clinical attention within the context of early childhood education. And if you think about then how we're working with children with externalizing behavior problems within the context of early childhood education, you have to understand the framework by which um, you know, educators in early childhood are generally working from. Um, so this is the pyramid model for promoting social emotional competence in infants and young children um, out of, um, Mary Louise Hemeter's work, and I've included a link here if you're interested in learning more and looking at all, all the tools. But essentially, this is an early childhood PBIS model, a multi-tiered system of support. And the idea is that um, you know, there needs to be universal practices that are implemented across the early childhood setting that really helps support nurturing and responsive relationships, high quality and supportive environments, so things that you do for all children. And when then you have children with externalizing behavior problems, you implement more targeted social emotional supports for those children. And that can vary based on the setting, um, but certainly it's a lot of skill building around um, understanding and identifying emotions in themselves and others. There's also been a number of interventions targeting social emotional competence, like the Incredible Years, Project Star, the Promoting Alternative Thinking Skills programs, um, and others that have worked to help you know, address some of these social emotional needs in the early childhood years. Um, but what often happens is that that is not enough and that for some kids it's not enough and we need to do more and work more intensively at the top of the pyramid to help address the impairment that these children potentially are experiencing so that they can have more success. So when we look then at our best practices in clinical care, um, particularly for young children with ADHD, are, you know, we have a long history of behavioral parent training programs, which is what is recommended as the first line of treatment for children, is particularly young children with ADHD by both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Society for Developmental and Pedi Behavioral Pediatrics. Um, and that that really be the first line of intervention that you take when a child has, um, has these types of concerns. What then, what do you do then when you finish your round of parent training and you need more? Well, then the idea is that you um, in invest in behavioral classroom interventions so that you can address some of the impairment in the classroom. Although sometimes, as I'll talk a little bit, that's a little bit more challenging than, than it's, it's interesting because ADHD from some data that we've collected over the last couple of years is not particularly well understood by preschool teachers. So when you give them an assessment of their knowledge of of ADHD, they're only about 30% accurate in understanding what ADHD is and the current the best practices in terms of treatment, which has implications obviously for referral and um, potentially for assessment. And what we would also recommend in terms of best practices, so some of the um, contingency management or the discipline practices that potentially would be 
implemented within the context of behavioral parent training, like timeout, are not always what is acceptable practice in the early childhood education setting. So there are then a number of um, things to then consider when we're thinking about how then to best work with these children. And it makes, it's then been leading our group to think about innovative ways that we can work with children within the context of a classroom and also working with their parents to really enhance outcomes um, from the beginning prior to this transition to kindergarten. Okay, so I'm going to go, so to a few things, and then I'm gonna talk about the, the intervention. So another thing to consider about some of our behavioral parent training programs specifically, because again, that's what's recommended as the first line treatment for children with ADHD, is that they often lack a academic component. And similarly, academic interventions often lack a behavioral component. So we don't always see that they're comprehensive in their focus on school readiness. And if we could be working together and not in silos, perhaps we would see better outcomes for these children. Um, we also see in terms of the timing of interventions that we have all of these interventions that potentially happen in the preschool years, but then there's this gap between the when preschool ends and when kindergarten begins that is maybe an untapped area where we could have some additional success, specifically prevent, perhaps in preventing the summer slide, which there's been a lot of data looking at um, like summer learning losses. And, you know, we have then, you know, schools can also do it all. So I, I think there's then we are, we're trying to also teach this message, message that this, there's just some things, especially given the new era of accountability within educational settings that they really can't do it all. And so we need to think about new places and spaces where we can address the mental health needs of young children. And I'm going to be arguing, I guess, spoiler alert for the summer as a great way, as a great place to do that. And that when we do recommend behavioral parent training, attendance in parent training programs, especially during this developmental time, is not great. And it's typically hasn't been representative of racial and ethnic minority families. And so maybe we need to think about different places, again, and spaces where we might be able to really enhance engagement for these families. And we generally have seen that most of our programs have lacked evaluation in culturally and linguistically diverse populations, which also requires some assessment or some addressing. And when, again, we look at the academic interventions for some of these young children, if we're just focusing on the early literacy skills, then we know we don't know how well those children who then also have comorbid externalizing behavior problems, how much they're really benefiting and how much these academic interventions support the parents in their learning and then their implementation of the skills after the school year and into the home setting. So with that, <laughs> we have over the last 10 years been developing our summer treatment program for pre-kindergartners, which is an eight week comprehensive school readiness program for young children with or at risk for developing ADHD and other related behavioral and early learning problems. And it was adapted from Bill Pelham's children's summer treatment program. Um, if you, I, I know that um, Dr. Pelham has come and talked um, with his group in the past. He may have talked a little bit about the summer treatment program, um, but it has been around for over 30 years and it is a best practice for children with ADHD. It's a very unique setting um, for uh, treatment to be occurring because it's really trying to provide a naturalistic context to work on all of the skills related to um, 
related to positive functioning across the board for children with ADHD. And his program was initially developed for elementary children. And what we've done is brought it down to the preschool population while considering all of the different school readiness domains that need to be addressed in preparation for kindergarten and also um, really trying to developmentally tailor it to this group. So our goals of the program are to work on all of these domains of school readiness. So improving social emotional skills and friendship, academic skills to be successful in the classroom, children's ability to focus and follow classroom rules and routines, improving their emotional functioning, their self-control skills and self-esteem, building the positive approaches to learning. We want kids to feel excited about going to school and about the learning process so that they can be lifelong learners. We also work on independent organizational and self-care skills, which is something that really shifts as you move to kindergarten, where you have to be more responsible for your belongings. Your parent can't, you know, drop you off at the school door. You're, you know, you drive up to the circle, you wave goodbye and navigate the hallways of the elementary school basically on your own. Although that has changed <laughs> somewhat with COVID. So you know, that's a totally different story. Um, and then also building these social skills within the context of sports, um, which is a common way that kids, uh, you know, socialize as they um, mature in age. And so building teamwork and sportsmanship and basic sports skills. And I would say most importantly, and one of the magic ingredients of our program, and that's what I tell all of the parents who participate is really to improve parent-child relationships because in terms of generalizability, we see the parent training piece of this program as key. This is how things are able to maintain over time. I've put, I didn't embed any videos of the program in the presentation today, but if you visit our website um, and you can see all of our different summer program options, you can watch some videos and see some testimonials of parents who have come through our program in the past. So what you see in terms of the day is that, there we go. Um, it really represents, uh, it's a full day program and represents a typical kindergarten day sprinkled with some summer camp fun, which is often a question that parents have for me when they're registering their child for the program. It seems like they're going to be working a lot. Like, are they going to have fun? And, and yeah, the answer is yes. And, and it certainly is a lot of work. So the, keep in mind too, that prior to what you won't see in here is a nap time period, which is also a big sort of developmental shift for families as they're moving from pre-K to kindergarten as the, you know, the, the nap time goes away from the classroom schedule. Um, however, I would say the significant majority of the children in our program were not doing well during rest period in their early childhood setting and were wide awake. So we keep them busy throughout the day. And I'll talk about each of these activities in turn. Um, but the group, the children are grouped in um, groups of 12 to 15 children. They are all transitioning to kindergarten. So they have to be five as of September 1st to be participating or, you know, going to kindergarten for the first time. Um, our staff ratio at minimum is one to three. Um, at most periods, it's one to two. And our staff are composed of really an interdisciplinary group. We have a lead teacher who's a certified teacher, uh, typically someone who's you know working in Miami-Dade County Public Schools during the year. We have a lead counselor who is traditionally a graduate student or um, similar background in psychology and then four to five paraprofessional counselors, all of whom are undergraduates in either psychology or education, or some who are interested in speech and language pathology. I'll do a shameless plug for hiring here. If you know of any um, students, uh, undergrads who are interested in getting hands-on applied training in working with young children with really challenging behaviors, and being hands-on, and we are going to be in person <laughs> this year, please have them apply. It's a, they do get a stipend for the summer, and I think it does. Um, I say that it, it's a, we're definitely, as much as it's a program for the kids, it's also a training platform for the next generation of hopefully our mental health uh, care and educational workers. So 
Um, and then also within the classroom is a speech team member. And this is a graduate student in speech and language pathology who is um, also, who is supervised by then a, um, a licensed speech pathologist. Our staff are supervised weekly um, and really daily <laughs> during the program. Um, we do a treatment integrity fidelity monitoring every week um, with feedback the same day, group supervision every week. And then every Friday, we have a lead case conference, which is an interdisciplinary case conference of the teacher, the psychologist, and the speech and language pathologist, and myself and the um, and the speech supervisor, where we adjust the targets for each of the children. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that in, in a moment. Um, the number of weeks can span from four to eight. So I'm gonna show you data of how this can work. It, it can work in, in a shorter time frame, four weeks. And then we see um, similar success when we double the time. And we run our program from eight to three and eight to five. It doesn't seem to make a difference in terms of the dose. Uh, it's as effective both. I, that's also a spoiler alert of some data I'll show you in a minute. But if you think about then the maximum schedule, which is 360 hours of intervention, that's seven years of weekly therapy. And so sometimes folks, when I present this, will say it's like a kindergarten boot camp. And, and I'll say that it is a little, a little bit of that um, for sure. So in terms of our core components of the program, the first is really our behavior modification system, which is has been adapted from the summer treatment program. We have seven main classroom rules, be respectful, follow directions, work quietly, um, et cetera, that are commonly or common rules in um, kindergarten settings. And then we, the children are earning and losing points based on their behaviors. They have tangible chips, um, which I don't know if you can see my cursor here on the screen, I hope so. Um, the, these are little point chip bags up in the front of the classroom where the children are depositing their um, point chips for the behaviors earned. Um, we also then use a response card or flip card system as, as a visual for points lost. So you, if you've spent any time in a kindergarten class, you've likely seen something similar to this. Um, and part of us incorporating this into the development of the program is we wanted kids to be to have some experience with things that they would see in the kindergarten setting. So you for it, what's different though about our implementation of this response cost system is that every period that ch the children get to start on green um, again. So if you then had to move your color from green to yellow because you were losing points for whatever um, behavioral violation, you um, then at the next, the start of the next period, you sort of get to start over to have more success. Um, the children have, there's a lot of praise and positive reinforcement for positive behavior. We have a really high praise to rule violation ratio, three to one, that, and that's part of what is um, measured through when we do our treatment integrity and fidelity measures. And every child has a daily report card, which is this picture over here to the right, um, where we choose two to three behaviors that we're trying to shape over time. And ideally having about 20% reduction in um, the targeted behavior over the course of a week and then modifying those targets weekly. Um, everything um, for the child in terms of some of the fun is earned. So recesses contingent on their progress on their daily report card, as well as fun Friday, um, which is kind of the culmination of the week. So we have daily and weekly reinforcers for positive behavior. Um, and also lots of daily rewards, high point kid, academic all-star, rewards for social, um, social skills and um, improvements in behaviors as well, and rewards that are connected to classroom jobs. Um, and implement in, I should say, point system and also a system of timeout that's implemented across the program. And I should say that all of the staff across the education, the psychologists and the speech and language pathologists are all trained in implementing the point system and do that throughout the activities of the day. 
So then we also have our social emotional curriculum, which we um, again adapted from the summer treatment program, but developmentally modified it to include uh, and incorporate um, some more developmentally appropriate puppets who introduce the social skills and the emotions of the day um, during the context of our classroom meetings. But then all of those are are then reinforced throughout the day during the daily activities. We also then have a self-regulation curriculum, which is an incorporated, they're adapted from um, Megan McClellan's circle time games, which are some of these regular games that many of us probably played when we were children, like red light, green light, freeze dance, um, except that what uh, she does in these games that then now we've incorporated into the context of this is it's a lot of practicing how to start and stop behaviors, how to then be a, you, there's, um, there's a system of then having practice of getting out and having to deal with not winning the game. Um, so there's, a there's, this is this particular picture, you're probably wondering why the kids are crawling on the floor is, <laughs> is red light, green light, safari. And so in a version, like as the, as the weeks of the program um, continue, the child, the game gets harder. And so when you hear red light, um, at some point you have to remember the rules of the game where you then have um, that red light means that you have to stop and be an animal that's on the ground. <laughs> so it, there, that's why they're on the ground. Um, turn it off. Okay, um, we also then have our academic activities and we do a variety of different instructional for, um, formats, whole group, small group, and independent instruction. Um, covering all topics, reading, math, science, and writing. We use the Literacy Express curriculum from Chris Lonigan's shop up at the Florida Center for Reading Research, um, which we, with in consultation with him, developed modified for our eight-week summer program because most preschool curriculum then go across the whole year. Um, and it really focuses on phonological awareness, print knowledge, and oral language vocabulary. And we then also have a handwriting curriculum that we use the handwriting without tears curriculum. And our recreational activities include sports, art, and computer, again, to build all the sports skills and a little bit about our speech and language services. Um, before I then show you some and talk about the parenting program and then show you some data is that every eligible children, so those are children who then are either already receiving speech and language services through their early childhood setting, so they have an IEP for speech and language, or we also provide an assessment at the start of the summer for any parent who has concerns that their child might need additional speech and language support. They then um, will receive two hours per week of speech and language therapy. It's a combination push and pull out model, so ideally two days a week of pull out, which is more traditional in its focus, and then two days of push in. Um, and parents receive weekly feedback about the language goals and how they can reinforce those. The really nice thing about the push in session and having the speech team as part of our whole treatment team is that we can really generalize the skills within the child's natural environment and with their peers. Okay. Um, and then our parenting program, which is, again, the magic ingredient, um, involves all the traditional aspects of behavior management, so improving parenting skills, parent-child relationship, discipline strategies, plus we also include school readiness topics. So we help parents set up a homework time routine um, in preparation for kindergarten where homework will be, um, you know, starting and um, also how they can support reading and math development with a focus on promoting dialogic reading specifically, and then supporting social, emotional, and self-regulation development, really thinking about how parents can model appropriate social, emotional, and self-regulation skills, and then how to really navigate this transition to school, so positive homeschool connections. Um, it is a hybrid model of service delivery, so it combines elements of the community um, with the COPE program and group PCIT. So there is active practice and active skill um, practice in groups within the context of the camp. And we incorporate some MI engagement strategies too to help maximize engagement. 
Um, we offer meals and childcare for all the sessions and the sessions run in the evenings after the camp day is through. So data. <laughs> um, it, basically what we're finding, it, this has now been 10 years, so I'm gonna present study or data from five of our studies. Um, this was some data from our first uh, RCT, which we did um, back in 2010. This is the first iteration where we actually had 25 kids who were, well, children, all these 50 children were randomized to receive either four weeks of our program, um, or our parenting workshops alone. Um, and what we found is that parents were more likely to come to the workshops if they were coming to, if their kids were getting camp, which maybe is not surprising, but I think it does definitely enhance um, par parent participation and parenting programming if you offer something for their kids as well. Um, so it meets a child care need in some way. Um, parents were really satisfied with our program and the KSRC, I should say too, was our earlier version of our summer treatment program um, for pre-kindergartners. And um, children who were in our program had more rapid improvement in their behavioral readiness for kindergarten as reported by their teachers. So they started the kindergarten year off on a better foot. They had less conflict um, with their teachers in the classroom, fewer disciplinary actions. Um, for those children who received our camp program and they had higher reading achievement scores at the end of kindergarten. And what I think is even perhaps more telling is they were eight times less likely to be retained in kindergarten after receiving our program, which is fantastic. Um, we then um, did we all that we learned a lot in this earlier version and we found out that we we thought that well four weeks might not be enough let's see if we can do more and so then we did an open trial of our eight week program with 30 children this was funding I should say that our pilot study was funded by the administration for children and families in the office of Head Start um, this open trial um, the funding for the program was from the children the children's trust and then research dollars from FIU um, so we had 30 children who participated in this program. All of them received our, our program. Um, again, it was well received. These were families who were living um, around the FIU area. And in terms of their school readiness outcomes, we saw really significant differences af after the intervention with really large effects, particularly for behavioral and attentional outcomes. Um, and most of the effects were maintained at six month follow up, except for emotion regulation. And I'll talk a, a little bit more about that um, because we then mindful of the time, time goes so fast <laughs> and I wanna show you all some additional data. So what we have also done is we've looked we've dismantled our program to figure out what components are really the key components to incorporate in the program. So we've basically done an evaluation looking again, a small randomized control trial. This was funded by that for, by IES looking at STP pre-K enhanced, which is basically everything, <laughs> behavior, academic, social, emotional, self-regulation and parent training versus STP sort of normal with no social, emotional and self-regulation components or parent training only. And in a group of families where, um, again, kind of representative of, of Miami, um, all of whom were uh, meeting diagnostic criteria for ADHD or ODD, we saw that our STP pre-K enhanced, so everything, you know, basically having everything, we see the most green lights, the most readiness for school across a variety of measures of school readiness. Um, and enough to and enough maintenance that it suggests that we should move forward with that model, which then we did, but we were wondering about the dose of intervention and if that matters. And so we did another RCT in um, the in the second year of this IES grant to look at if it matters how much of the program you get. And again, I gave this away, but it didn't really seem 
Um, if you got school consultation, which then didn't involve summer at all, just support during the kindergarten year with a behavioral consultant that came out to your school once a week or four weeks of our summer program or eight weeks of our program. And what we see is that the children who received the eight week program seem to have more green lights um, across the board on a number of different um, measures, but the, the four week program also had um, also had a significant gains. I would say that the eight week program had some more favorable um, re uh, outcomes in terms of their self regulation. But, you know, we still see there's a lot of benefit of the four week program school consultation. Interestingly, you know, they weren't as ready at the start of the kindergarten year, but by the end of the kindergarten year with behavioral support during kindergarten, they were doing OK. Um, so then I want to also show you some data from our speech and language outcomes from our program, because I know there's um, some folks represented that would be interested in this, but we see really large effect sizes on the PLS-5 um, in, on all domains of language for those children who are receiving our speech and language services, which is also really positive. Um, so that has really, like after these studies, it really, got us thinking about how could we maintain gains for those for some of the children who just receive our summer program during the kindergarten year. Um, we do do have some school year challenge like and addressing those school year challenges. It's some are I would say two thirds of our children start school off really strong and another third really need additional additional support as they move into the kindergarten year. But we also wanted to know if this is feasible and transportable to other places. Um, and I won't get to talk about this today, but we've had some of our graduates, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about this, about using this for other populations like children with developmental delays and autism spectrum disorders. So the last five years, we've been working on transporting this model to a early childhood setting in Liberty City to promote school readiness. And so I'm going to show you some data from that, but just to you know, to talk about the importance, you know, we, there are higher rates of these challenging behaviors within um, populations of children living in, in poverty. And we see though a major access to care problem for these children. And so we have tried to think about, we've tried to then think about how we could bring this to places that they can be. Because if you're living in Liberty City and you would potentially qualify for a program, it's probably not likely that you can get on a bus to go to FIU every day to engage in a program. So we have partnered then with an early childhood setting, um, special education setting in Liberty City to provide our program. Um, it is seven weeks instead of eight weeks. I've tried to do a little comparison table so you can see the difference. Um, instead of our, our staff who come to our program for some, our summer treatment program come from all over the country, um, we have tried to really place preference in Summer Academy on staff who are currently or are from the community we serve or who are currently working in the community serve to sort of have there be a continuum of care within the context of our program. Um, we provide breakfast, lunch, and snack to all the children. The day is a little bit shorter, but consistent with the Head Start programming that is currently going on at the school. Um, we do our parent training as opposed to it being in the evenings. We do it during the mornings and the afternoons with makeup sessions available. Um, we've also included a parent liaison from the school community to enhance caregiver engagement. And she's, she's the one who makes all the calls to the parents to make sure they're coming to parent training and bringing their kids to the program every day. So the dose of the intervention is a little bit lower, but still you did the math about four and a half years of weekly therapy. So how do we do this? How do we make this work? What's the funding? The Children's Trust, thank you so much to them. Um, so we are able to provide the program free of charge for families with a $50 registration fee. Covers all of our operating costs um, for nine weeks. So that includes two weeks of staff training, which is really intensive and important at the start of the program. 
as well as a coordinator effort during the year. And we get the rental of the school facility free of charge, um, you know, with the exception of having to pay the janitors overtime um, to help at having us there. And it also covers the speech and language services for the children in need. So what I'm gonna to present to you now is data from 115 children who have been um, participated in our program over the last three years. Um, I have then a subset of those children who we have included in follow-up analyses. So you can see some of the maintenance of gains during the kindergarten year. Predominantly male representative of the Liberty City community with 80% um, of children living below the poverty line. And I'll present data on feasibility and acceptability as well as some preliminary promise of the program on several of these domains of school readiness. So we have gotten really high percentages of um, attendance in our program. So our children on average are uh, participating 90% of the days of camp. Our parents are coming to parent training 85% of the time, which is also tremendous when you think about um, really engaging parents who have a variety of different needs and stressors in, in this process. Um, really high levels of parent satisfaction, parents enjoy being there, they're seeing benefits for their child, they're also recommending it to other families and they feel like they're achieving some goals and increasing their confidence to manage future behavior problems. And we can do the program as well as we do it in our FIU setting, um, but I would say that this is a little spoiler alert again, but it is um, kind of a Cadillac program. We haven't figured out ways to kind of reduce our ratio or think about other ways to do this because it does require, um, based on the intensity of the behavioral challenges of the children, um, require a lot of staff and infrastructure. Um, but we can do this well and we're seeing good engagement in other settings. Um, in terms of outcomes, we're seeing really um, solid effects for, this is on the BRAC and this is a school readiness assessment. So really incredible gains in the children's early school readiness skills, which are um, largely maintained over time into the kindergarten year, which is awesome. Um, we also see pretty significant reductions in behavioral impairment as rated on the impairment rating scale with fewer kids meeting clinical threshold for behavioral impairment, also positive, and most of that is maintained at six-month follow-up. Um, and we're also seeing improvements on um, symptoms of externalizing behavior problems, although I would argue that, you know, what's more important is really this functional impairment, um, the functional impairment piece of the data. Um, and then finally, looking at our parenting outcomes, we have then, this is if you're a PCIT person in the room, so parent-child interaction therapy, looking at the do and don't skills. So this is the parent's uptake of positive parenting skills, really strong um, effects in terms of um, their uptake of do skills at post-intervention, as well as their reduction in don't skills. So those are those more critical um, the don't skills are the more critical skills um, or the negative parenting skills. And that those are largely maintained at, um, at six month follow-up. So our conclusions after doing all of this is that, you know, we have established at least that we can do this. Uh, it's feasible, acceptable to stakeholders and somewhat promising in, um, in other community settings and our acute outcomes have strong effects similar to our other um, STP pre-K efficacy trials. Um, we do need to have, you know, we only have a proportion of kids who have participated, families who have participated in our follow-up. And um, what I will say is that there, we have not been able to provide any follow-up services. And I think that's something that we want to explore um, 
in future research studies in terms of what kind of support is needed to really best prepare these children for transitioning into their kindergarten settings because um, many of them are transitioning into some of our district's poorest performing schools and so the resources are scarce um, it's harder to get the help needed and um, what potentially could we do to best move the needle um, it's not without its challenges. We have a number of logistical and practical barriers. I'm happy to talk about those if for those of you who are interested. Um, I think that, you know, funding is certainly a factor to dissemination and sustainability as well. You know, we live in a really incredible community that we have something like the Children's Trust that can provide programming um, free to families and but that's not all settings and the STP has been exported to a number of different places but typically people are having to pay you know upwards of 5,000 for the summer and it's not covered most of the activities of the STP are not covered um, by insurance because of the just sheer amount of, of treatment that the children are getting so it's something to consider. Um, so where are we heading now as a group? And then I will uh, will stop for questions. Um, I, you know, we are trying to uh, think about, as I mentioned before, thinking about what we can do during the school year. Um, I, you know, waiting the once we get these kids in the summer, it's like, oh, it feels bad that we've waited <laughs> so long. Or you know, we've. They've had a whole year or more of really significant challenges. And is there more that we can do during the year that would help support them to um, you know, have a, the smoothest transition possible to kindergarten? I do think that we need greater workforce development in early childhood to help them help early childhood educators understand ADHD and how to deal with that within the context of their classrooms. Maybe we need to work younger. We need to perhaps think about the sequencing of interventions if we think about um, what we can do, um, you know, behavioral parent training first, but then when do we consider medication? At what, at what point um, do we think about that? And we have published some work that was highlighted in the New York Times in 2019. Um, looking at parents' perceptions of medication treatment and basically, you know, young kids with um, young parents of children with ADHD, young children with ADHD are really on the fence about medication. Only 50% of them would try it um, if it was recommended by a medical professional. Um, and but that is in that is predicted by the level of aggression that is also going on for their child. So parents who have children who are perhaps more aggressive, so they're engaging in more aggressive behaviors in the classroom setting, are then more like more willing to think about medication. So I want to thank uh, again you all for for your attention today, as well as all of our funders. Um, our school and community partners, we really couldn't do this alone. Our staff, um, the families who have participated in this work, my lab, my students, grad students, postdocs, um, and the Center for Children and Families. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Looks like we've got a question in the chat. So the question was, are children who have recently participated in PCAT eligible for the pre-K summer treatment program? It depends on the location. <laughs> Actually, yes, I will say there's a chance for both. So we have our, our program in Liberty City, yes, 100%. So if it's a family that you're seeing that lives in the Liberty City community and would potentially benefit, it's not, it's not a rollout. Um, we currently have a grant, um, my colleague, Paulo Graziano, who is the co-director of the program with me and is leading the FIU site now while I'm leading the Summer Academy site in Liberty City. Um, they have a study going on where it precludes, um, you can't have participated in parent training prior to the summer, but we do have slots, 15 specifically available that don't like are open. Um, so if you do have a family who's interested, I would call, have them call soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that anyone has, you can put them in the chat or go ahead and unmute. 
All right. Well, as we're coming up on one o'clock, thank you so much, Dr. Hart, for, Dr. Hart, for coming in and giving us this presentation today. We're great to, uh, grateful to have you back over at Mailman Center to present. Thank so, you. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much for the opportunity. Thank you all for your attention. Stay well, be healthy. Thank you, everyone. Michelle, do you want me to hang on for a second? Yeah, if you want to just stay on and that way if anyone has any other questions in, but otherwise as we're coming up on one o'clock, thank you everybody for your time and joining us for Grand Rounds today. Dr. Hart, can you hear me? Yes, hi Angela. Hi, um, I just had a quick question. Um, as far as when you do the parent training portion for the families, do you usually do that in only one language or do you have separate like rooms for the parents preferred language? We have separate rooms for the parents preferred language. So we have English groups, Spanish groups, and when, when it's needed, we have had a Creole group, um, but we predominant, so it, but that hasn't been a need as much over at, at the FIU side as much as it's been a need over at our Liberty City site. But we are, I think it's really important and our staff are able to do that. That's great. And the, the, do the parents find any difference as far as um, that the, the kids are getting mostly everything throughout the day in one language and then they're receiving the training in Spanish or it really, they don't find any problem with that part of it? I don't think that they find any problem with that, you know, it, because kindergarten, even if you're in an ESOL program here in Miami-Dade County and, and almost 100% of our, well, I wouldn't, I guess not 100%, but a significant majority are transitioning to Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Most of them likely English is going to be the primary language of instruction. And so we do require that children have at least an understanding of English language to participate. So if they were just solely Spanish speaking, our staff, like for the actual child portion of the day are speaking in English. And if a child was predominantly Spanish speaking and did not have enough command of the English language, they would have a really hard time understanding the point system and, and all of the academic material. So we might recommend something else for that family. That makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Good seeing you. Good seeing you too. Yeah, and we'll definitely plan to get in terms of some of the information so we can make sure to share this with us a moment in terms of what the process is for, you know, referring families over to you. So I don't know if you have materials or if the, you know, send me the website, and we'll get that out to everybody. Yes, absolutely. I can do both. I'll, I'll send that out later this afternoon. Okay. Hi, Anna E. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, I can't hear you. I see you talking, but I don't know if your headphones. I was listening, but I was multitasking. <laughs> like always. As we all are, yes. <laughs> but I was listening. Great presentation. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Michelle, for sending that information how to refer. I have a couple of families that I'm thinking of that I evaluated in a side clinic that would be perfect for your program. So it's Liberty City. The one for your Liberty City is only Liberty City or includes other areas around it, like Opalaka and stuff like that? For sure. If the, the challenge is really if they can get to the program, um, but they certainly, it we just has to, if in and around the Liberty City community, and I sort of include North, North Miami, Opalaka, Miami Gardens and that, it, it, but they do have to provide transportation. So that's something to consider. We haven't figured out how to do the bus service <laughs> at this point. I, yeah. And this year with COVID is not the year to really think about how to do that too, because we're just trying to figure out how to have everyone be there safely and do, you know, do the program to our best of our ab ability and keeping everyone safe. With the Liberty City site, when it goes only till three, is there child care then within that site where you are past three o'clock for those kids that's yes. available? Okay. Yeah. So we're open, the center is open until five. Um, and so we do provide childcare for families after three o'clock if needed. Okay, so that makes it in terms of more accessibility for families if that doesn't become a factor if they need something past three o'clock, perfect. For sure. 
Well, thank you so much for coming in to do this. I'm not sure if anybody else has any questions. I see Michelle. It's impressive what you've pulled off. <laughs> I was oh, like, thank you. yes. I feel like I could talk for days about, I wanted to show so much data. And then I was like, I'm talking too much about like what we're actually doing. Um, and, but I hope that people got a good sense. No, I of, think that's great. And the more, and especially if you think about it for making referrals, the more that we've got a sense of what does this program look like on a day to day, it's yeah. really helpful to have that piece. So okay. I think you're able to do it nicely, be able to have that mix between there and presenting the data to show that it's effectiveness. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome.